Okay, uh, we are going live in three, two, one. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on audit quality. We'll talk about definition and the driver and, and indicators of audit quality uh, during the next two hours. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us for, for this webinar organized by Accountancy Europe. My name is David Herbinet and I'm the uh, chair of uh, the uh, Audit and Assurance Policy Group of Accountancy Europe. Uh, I'm also uh, a partner at, uh, at Mazar. Um, we are going to spend two really interesting hours and uh, in order to make this time uh, interesting and uh, engaging, we uh, you uh, have access to a Slido. Uh, I, I don't know if all of you know Slido, but it's, you can get Slido on uh, on the Google App Store or the um, or the Apple Apps uh, Apple Store. Um, and going to Slido, you simply need to enter um, AQIs in there, and you will get access to uh, to an environment where you can ask questions of the uh, of the panel for for the next uh, next two hours. So, please, that's a Slido time. Uh, uh, get get in Slido, and uh, and you can engage in this way with uh, with the uh, with the, the the participants in the seminar in the webinar. Uh, so that's uh, on the organization. Um, let me first of all give a few words of introductions of uh, of this webinar. Um, you know, the topic of audit quality indicators is is really uh, pertinent at this point in time. Uh, Accounts Europe released in uh, in uh, just a few days ago uh, a fact sheet uh, called Overview of Global Initiatives in relation to audit quality indicators. It, it provides an overview of, of what's, what's happening. Uh, it's not necessarily meant to be comprehensive, but it gives a, a really broad range of approaches uh, coming from all continents. And, uh, you know, trying to illustrate the desire and the need to approach audit quality with more data in, in lots and lots of places. Um, in terms of context, we've got the context of ISQM1. Uh, that is going to have a transfer, transformational approach to, to quality management. Uh, and even though there are not many overt references to, to AQIs necessarily in ISQM1, there are many uh, indirect links to, 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 to it. So, you know, all of this is, is, is very much consistent. Um, we also have in terms of important context in, in Europe, uh, the recent uh, European consultation to improve uh, quality and enforcement of corporate reporting. And within this, there were some very clear uh, questions in relation to the quality indicators uh, and some very direct references to, um, to, to, to them. So, you know, audit quality is, of course, uh, paramount in, uh, in the audit market uh, on the back of you know, many challenges of the audit profession, I would say, um, and all of these initiatives happening uh, in, in a lot of places uh, bring their own contribution to the, uh, to the, to the, to the thinking around um, the, the definition of quality indicators and, and their measurement. So in order to illustrate uh, what's, uh, what's happening uh, in, in relation to audit quality indicators, uh, I'm very pleased that we have a, a number of, uh, of, of very uh, of very important speakers on on, on this topic. Uh, so we will have presentations of about 15 to 20 minutes each from uh, four uh, countries. Uh, we'll start with uh, Van Vanessa Teitelbaum, and I will introduce Vanessa in a minute. Uh, then we we'll move on to Arnut. Um, uh, Tiago Ferreira and Maria will do a joint presentation for CMVM and Joachim Schindler will uh, conclude this uh, series of, 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 of presentations to bring um, an audit committee perspective um, to, to the topic. So that, that's the first part. We'll give you a, you know, a flavor of, of, of things that are happening in, in a few jurisdictions. Um, then we'll have a short break. Uh, and then we'll move to a panel discussion um, where we are going to explore some of these questions a little further. 
Um, and that's when, uh, during this panel discussion, that um, you will be able to to bring your your slide or question in, and we will see how we uh, we, we 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 make this uh, an engaging and interesting uh, discussion with uh, with the panel. Okay, so that's that's a broad approach for for the next two hours. Uh, so I propose that we we start straight away with our our, our series of uh, of presentation. And we'll start with uh, Vanessa Teitelbaum. Uh, Vanessa is a senior director in professional practice at the Center for Equality in uh, in the U.S. in Washington D.C. Uh, Vanessa, you've been uh, on the with the CAQ for six years now, and uh, previously you were uh, you were uh, working with uh, you know in the audit profession with uh, with Price Waterhouse Coopers and uh, and and Dixon Hughes Goodman. Um, you have worked on all sorts of issues facing the audit auditing profession to, during your time at the CAQ, uh, notably on, on AQIs, on firm systems of control, uh, of quality control and management, on independence, use of technology, uh, etc., etc. So, Vanessa, delighted to have you here today, uh, and um, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate being invited, and um, nice to be here. Um, as you mentioned, I am at the Center for Audit Quality, uh, which is in the U.S. And just to give a short background on the CAQ, um, we are a um, autonomous public policy organization in the U.S. We are affiliated uh, with the AICPA, but we are not a standard setter. Um, we are not a regulator, so we are not authoritative in that way. So the publications that we have put out um, we develop in consultation with our member firms, um, which are accounting firms. And so um, they are intended to be helpful to the profession, certainly, and to other stakeholders. Um, and so AQIs, Audit Quality Indicators, has been a topic um, close to our heart for much of the duration of our existence. And we came um, into being in around 2007. Um, and so we have a long history uh, with AQIs um, because of the interest um, historically that uh, the U.S. regulator for accounting firms, the PCAOB, um, has, has expressed. So this group probably knows that there was a concept release back in 2015. Um, and prior to that, in 2014 through 2016, um, the CAQ did extensive amount of work working on developing, thinking about AQIs. And uh, we have several publications on our website, um, which are uh, the approach to AQIs was 2014. Um, Continuing on the journey was published in 2016, which explains a lot of our findings from roundtables. Um, and so in 2019, one of the, what I wanna talk about today is our most recent publication, which was published, uh, released in January 2019, and that is called the Audit Quality Disclosure Framework. And the reason that we worked on this publication and developed this publication was after some time had gone by, uh, we, with our member firms, uh, continued to keep an eye on AQIs. Um, it is continues to be in the strategic plan, which is publicly uh, made available by the PCAOB, Although we don't see it on the standard setting uh, agenda or the research agenda of the PCAOB, and you may know that there is a new board as of January 2022. So we have keen interest, you know, to see what their standard setting priorities are. Um, so it's it's not at the moment um, expected to. They are not expected to come out with a proposed standard. Uh, but it, it continues to be on everyone's radar. And David, as you mentioned, there is a lot of intersections with ISQM, which of course is effective the end of this year. And the standards from the PCOB on quality control, there was a concept release on that in 2019, and that is on their short-term standard setting agenda. So it could come up in that context. It, we, we did see some preliminary um, proposed language in the concept release. So back to our audit quality disclosure framework, the reason the genesis for that publication and the work we did there was because in the US, again, you may know, uh, 
transparency reports are, are not required as they are in some other non-US jurisdictions. But many firms over the years, especially the larger firms, began to publish what is called audit quality reports. And I would say in the past few years, there's even more firms publishing those um, and, and they've evolved over time. And so we, uh, the CAQ with our member firms, came to the conclusion that it might be useful uh, to put to have some consistency um, among audit quality reports that firms are are publishing. And at the time, th firms were beginning to think about publishing. Um, and so, again, working this was in consultation with our member firms, which are accounting firms in 2018 is when we developed it and published 2019. And so again, this is on our website. So our audit quality disclosure framework is intended to provide a framework, as it suggests, um, for an accounting firm that might be considering uh, issuing uh, an, an audit quality report. Um, we so I just want to talk a little bit and, and some of the summary of this is in the recent fact sheet that the Accountancy Europe uh, put out, as David mentioned this past Friday. Um, so there's three principles to our framework. One is that it's it's voluntary and illustrative um, because again we're not a standard setter. So this is um, you know the idea of using this framework is not mandatory or required. It's suggested. Um, it's intended purposefully to be flexible. One of the big findings that we found back doing the work in 2014 and 2016 on AQIs and our view still. Um, although we continue to talk to member firms to understand if this is evolving, and I think that will be a big discussion of today's program um, is one of the big findings was that identifying those AQIs that are what I will call the silver bullet is very difficult. And we have heard that if there was a silver bullet out there, a metric, a group of metrics that really told stakeholders, including the partners, the audit committee, you know, the the smoke was there and there was a big issue with the audit. I mean, firms certainly would want to know that and want to track that. Um, and there are things that you can look at. We'll talk about those, but there's not a silver bullet. Not only is there not a silver bullet, um, the way that firms think about uh, their practices, manage risk for their practices, collect and track data and define terms varies. And so even if you wanted to suggest that a specific AQI, uh, something relatively sim simple like staff ratio, um, that, that can be challenging even, even though the, the metric is simple because one firm may have different um, seniority. So you might have a lot of managing directors uh, versus partners. You might have su supervisors versus seniors or managers. So it, it, can, get, it can get complicated quickly. Um, and so, we wanted the, the disclosure framework to provide some consistency, but yet yeah, be flexible. So that was the second principle. And the third principle, which I think is an important distinction, is that this disclosure framework is referring to firm level disclosures, which you would expect for an audit quality report of a firm. And often when we talk about AQIs, it, 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 I think it's an important distinction to make. There are engagement level AQIs, which um, I think a, an audit team could talk to their audit committee about and that staff ratio for example is a good example where you could have that uh, measure um, again for the engagement what is the number of individuals on your engagement but when we look at the disclosure framework we're talking firm level um, then we we developed our disclosure framework um, in to, to mirror ISQC1, which was in existence, uh, the International Standard for Quality Control, which was the standard for quality control at the time we published this. Um, we are actually in the process of updating this to mirror ISQM1, which is uh, now final and will be effective at the end of the year. Um, so the disclosure framework is organized in six elements, um, which is leadership culture and firm governance. That's number one. Number two, ethics uh, and independence. Uh, number three, acceptance and continuance of clients and engagements. Uh, number four is engagement team management um, under ISQM. That'll be that's resources. Um, and then number five is audit engagement performance. And number six is monitoring. And for those of you familiar with ISQM, 
um, that is now monitoring and remediation. And so, the, as you may know, that the two elements that are not in our disclosure framework uh, because they're new to ISQM is, is risk assessment and information and communication. Uh, but in terms of the ISQC and the elements that we worked with at the time, what we did as a task force is we talked about and, and published why are these elements important to audit quality? What do firms think about? The, the whole goal of our disclosure framework and we think the goal of audit quality report should be to for a firm to tell their story about how they manage audit quality, ideally in something of plain English for stakeholders to understand. We, we think that a lot of times investors specifically aren't as familiar with all of the good work that firms invest and have in place. Um, to be honest, when I was a senior manager at PwC, I was on a project to work on the um, ISQC1 for the firm. I didn't know at that time in my career about ISQC1. I learned a lot about all the independence controls that existed. I was just on the user end of it. I had no idea that we selected a sample of partners. We, the firm, they, the firm, selected a sample of partners and did these audits. Um, so there was so much that I that I learned. As a, as a senior manager at the time. And so it was about trying to tell the story um, and, and also be balanced. Um, so we have the elements and then we have what we call three levels. And so the elements are number, level number one. And then we have points of focus, which is a kind of a qualitative, um, you know, when you get into the nitty gritty of ISQC1, trying to pull back a little bit and focus on what are the key points processes that are important to expound upon. And then we have example AQIs, um, again, firm level. So it, our framework intentionally is not all inclusive and it is not trying to suggest that every example should be published, but it is trying to say collectively, what are some examples that are, you know, maybe considered. And so, uh, the types of examples that are in the framework at the firm level um, for each of the elements um, are things like um, how does leadership, how is leadership evaluated and held accountable um, specifically related to audit quality, um, whether leadership, for example, obtains independent views. Um, so some firms, not all, will have these um, audit quality committees or councils and some are bringing on independent whether it's a board member or director or senior advisor that's a newer trend you know one of the reasons why we focus on this in this framework about it being voluntary and flexible is because in our experience in and thinking about what should be mandated and regulated um, is that it's Many of these practices may be good, but when you try to think about one size, it's not always one size fits all. And so if some of these requirements were to become mandated in the U.S., we think there could be, and we reflected this in some of our comments to the PCOB in the past, the trickle down, it could be, you know, the cost could um, outweigh the benefit, arguably. Um, but it's good, we think it's, it's warranted for firms to think about it. So. Um, ethics and independence, how the firm monitors partner rotation, um, like I was talking about before, what percentage of professionals and or audit engagements are chosen for internal um, review specific to independence. Um, one thing we didn't get into in this disclosure framework, but we may talk about this later on this webinar, is the use of technology. I think as audit firm software changes and the data is more accessible, more visible, um, and when it comes to independence, it, it becomes more relevant. So I, I know from colleagues at certain firms, there may be, for example, a, a broker uh, that is required. So all your entire investment portfolio is maintained with a specific vendor, and then there may be an automated link from your investment portfolio to the independent system. And so that takes you know, a lot of manual work out of it. And then that makes it easier for the firm at a firm level to monitor uh, whether or not investments are um, acceptable, right? Because usually for a manager or a partner, 
when you um, input all your investments into certain kinds of software, you get these red X or green check if it if it's acceptable or not. And if it's not, then you get rid of it. And it because of the complexity, that's a really strong control and that may not have existed five or 10 years ago. Um, so that's an example. Um, for acceptance and continuance, um, how firms determine it has the relevant competence, including time and resources. These are, that's probably one of the most important um, prevent controls about for risk management. For engagement team mon uh, management, um, how audit quality is promoted as part of performance evaluation is an example. Um, how you monitor staff workload is an example. Um, in terms of engagement performance, one of the things that comes up a lot is monitoring formal milestones. Um, this, I think, has evolved over time. At my time as an auditor, there were some looser goals and I think some firms not not always have some tighter deadlines so for planning for interim for controls testing um, this has probably always been a best practice but it's really monitoring it more closely and having some reports on it um, so that's an example I think of a strong indicator um, of audit quality it doesn't mean it, it's really about and we talk about this with ISQM1 as well I don't think it's that there's an there's an it's about preventing an issue, seeing an issue, adding more resources. If you know their staff turnover, if you know a firm a, a engagement team is getting behind, it's you know how do you you help and support a team and, and see some warning signs ahead of time. Um, so that was that's engagement performance, and then um, for monitoring. There's a lot of, I think there's more uh, objective metrics when it comes to monitoring. Uh, commonly disclosed is internal and external inspection results, um, severity of findings, the number of engagements for for the external inspections, PCOB, that's public. But for internal inspections, which often are very robust as well, um, that is only disclosed voluntarily and, and is commonly disclosed. And then I think what's especially helpful is understanding how the ins internal inspection results are evaluated. Is it systemic? What's the root cause? Um, and also, interestingly, we put in our disclosure framework our uh, not just sort of the misses, the the negative instances of audit of audit quality, but the positive ones as well. Positive audit quality events. Um, that's equally important, I, I would argue, when it comes to understanding audit quality. So I'm looking at the time. I think those are the primary points that we wanted to make and look forward to participating in the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Really interesting. And as you say, we'll, we'll come back to some of these points lay, later, later on. Um, so our next speaker will be on uh, a video uh, because Arnold van Kempen, Kempen could not be with us today, but uh, he has some really uh, important messages for for this. So we will swap to um, a, a video for for Arnold, and uh, I'll I'll be back after this video. And now we're happy to go to our uh, next uh, speaker, Arnold van Kempen. Um, Arnold formerly uh, was employed at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the Netherlands. He then joined the Dutch Financial Markets Oversight Body, AFM. Subsequently, he uh, was at the Dutch professional body, then called NIVRA, now MBA, but since 15 years, Arnold is a self-employed compliance professional. And in that uh, capacity, he chaired uh, the working party 
in the Netherlands that proposed audit quality indicators to the Dutch quartermasters who proposed those to the Dutch Ministry of Finance. Welcome, uh, Arnold, and uh, very happy to have this interview with you. And let us go immediately to the first uh, question, uh, which is about basically the process that you followed in the Netherlands to develop audit quality indicators and also what was the trigger, what was the reason to do that. So very happy to uh, hear how this went. Thank you. I think uh, to understand what we did and why we did it, it's uh, good to understand uh, how it all started uh, about 20 years ago, in fact, with the collapse of uh, Arthur Anderson and some uh, uh, Dutch uh, audit uh, scandals as well. Uh, since then, a lot has been done to improve uh, trust in the, uh, uh, the audit uh, uh, profession. And um, Time after time, signals were given that the trust was not uh, being restored uh, enough. And one of the latest actions was a committee uh, um, uh, installed by the Ministry of Finance a few years ago uh, that had to do uh, research into the matter of, of audit trust and uh, uh, gave recommendations. And uh, one of those recommendations was uh, that there has to be more transparency. The problem with the audit opinion is that uh, as an outsider, it's almost impossible to understand the difference between a good and a bad opinion um, in, in, in matters of, of quality of audit performed. So uh, you can have an oversight, uh, you can have all kinds of measures like education and, and, and well, you name it, but the problem remains the same that the outside world doesn't uh, have its own uh, way to assess uh, quality. And the idea was that with some uh, standardized uh, uh, indicators, uh, you could provide uh, stakeholders with the information needed to understand quality uh, delivered by uh, the auditor. And that was the basis uh, for the, the uh, work being done. Uh, the Ministry of Finance has, uh, after this commission, appointed two quartermasters, as we call them in, in the Netherlands. Um, one of them was on the committee, uh, one of them, uh, a lawyer, uh, is uh, from outside um, and they have the uh, uh, job of, uh, well, taking the, the findings of the committee forward and uh, uh, bettering audit uh, quality and, and especially audit trust. Uh, well, one of those uh, subjects was audit quality indicators. Uh, so what the quartermasters did was uh, ask uh, a, a working party. They started with four working parties and then a second working party uh, had to uh, uh, take all the results of the first uh, uh, together uh, to uh, give to the quartermasters an, an, a proposal of audit quality indicators. Uh, I chaired one of the first uh, working parties and I chaired the second one. And what we did was, uh, within constraints given by the quartermasters, uh, discuss well all kinds of possibilities, uh, what you can measure, what you can usefully uh, produce. You can measure a lot, but not all is, is very useful. Um, the members of the working parties were all professionals uh, from the uh, profession itself, uh, all with some at least a uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, interest in this subject. We had people from the big four, we had people from uh, smaller firms, uh, we had independent uh, professionals like myself, uh, but all with some focus uh, one way or the other on this kind of information. We have since the, um, uh, the law uh, on oversight 15 years ago, for the large companies uh, or the large firms, we have the uh, obligation to produce every year a report, what we call a transparency report on quality. So there is 
a lot of knowledge within the big companies uh, about this kind of information, but that's all based on what's uh, required by the law. Um, so it's only a starting point. Um, well, those working parties, uh, we, we started with constraints set by the quartermasters. They have indicated on what level they thought uh, information had to be provided in the quality indicators and uh, well, some, some limitations on what can be um, uh, produced and cannot be produced. Uh, there are obviously uh, privacy matters at, uh, uh, at hand. Uh, there are matters, matters about uh, confidentiality. Uh, so that gives constraints, but also um, you want indicators that can be used by uh, big firms and small firms. Uh, firms that operate in uh, the public interest entity market, uh, uh, the real financial markets or uh, the small and medium entity market. Um, and, and you don't want indicators that are too different for each uh, uh, part of the market. So that's, that's a whole set of constraints we uh, got from the quartermasters. And with that, we have uh, started and, and had uh, <laughs> session after session uh, to, to um, uh, find uh, ideas uh, that, that we could uh, have. And the, the way we worked was starting with, uh, uh, well, like anything, uh, any idea got on the list and then we have subsequently uh, uh, followed that list and discussed, is this reasonable? Is this useful? Is this possible? Um, and, and in the end, we had a list of um, uh, uh, quality indicators uh, and not just a list of indicators. I mean, each indicator has uh, pages full of uh, uh, explanation and where do you get your information from and what are you going to do with it and so on. Uh, how do you make them comparable? How do you make them objective enough? Um, and then uh, we brought that back to a, 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 a group of indicators. We thought this is this is reasonable. With that, we uh, uh, asked the quartermasters if we could uh, go to a few firms to test uh, the possibility to to reproduce the information asked. Uh, well, quartermasters uh, liked the idea, so that uh, we did that. Um, uh, so, so we could test if it's even possible uh, to, to, uh, for the firms to produce this information. Also helps, uh, I think, in the future discussion, uh, because uh, no doubt firms will uh, have their uh, say about uh, the indicators proposed. Um, and you don't want to have too much discussion uh, where a firm says, well, it's, it's impossible to produce this information. And as quartermasters, you you should say, well, we have no idea if it's possible. Then you lose any discussion uh, of forehand. So that's uh, that was tested. Another thing we wanted to test, but this was much harder, was uh, the question: How usable are those indicators? Because in the end, uh, a good indicator is an indicator that's being used by stakeholders. Uh, we can produce any information, but if nobody does anything with it, it's it's uh, just a waste of time. Uh, and that's one of the things uh, we we found that it's hard to find stakeholders who can help you with this. Uh, so that's well a bit less tested. Okay. Thank you very much for the insight. It's actually very interesting because there are different stakeholders, and that for sure will have different expectations or different, uh, you know, um, I would say uh, connections with an audit quality indicator. Some have to prepare it, others have to use it. So that can create different expectations. Yeah. So if, you know, any organization looks to develop audit quality indicators, um, what would you believe from, you know, the process that uh, you were chairing and also the quality indicators itself, uh, themselves that you were coming up with, what would be the main lessons learned, how to actually uh, have a good process to develop audit quality indicators? Yeah, I think there's a few lessons to be learned. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, don't uh, uh, be too worried if the process is not ideal, uh, because you will find that it is very hard to find stakeholders that can give you 
a, a, a clear expectation of what they want. And that's, if you think about it, not that strange. Um, let's say if you are going to buy a car, uh, you want it to be good, but you don't want all kind of quality indicators about the car. Uh, maybe you read a test, uh, but that's about it. Um, another opinion is, is in many ways something that users of that opinion, they don't want to have a question, is this a good or a bad opinion? They want it to be good. And they leave it up to the profession uh, to guarantee that it is good. Um, and that maybe there's a difference between uh, one firm or the other, and there can reasons uh, can be reasons why you want to have uh, to deal with one or the other. But for the user of the audit opinion, uh, we we found that they have not very much interest in all kind of details about quality. They have just a very high expectation about quality itself. So it's that's that's hard. You, you will find that it's it's a problem to to get that information clear. On the other hand, you have to uh, at least think about it uh, and have to uh, uh, um, place yourself in the mind of the stakeholders, because it's 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 not really a big deal to to find indicators and uh, to uh, demand uh, uh, firms to produce the information. I think that's that's one of the lessons you also don't listen to the firms about how hard it is and how they think it's uh, it's a problem because they always will find it a problem and they will always want to do less than than you can think of uh, which is logical they have other things uh, to do uh, but that's that's not really the big constraint for the firms the only constraint is is it possible if it's not possible to produce information, then you shouldn't. But if you think it's useful and it is possible, then you can make an indicator of it. But the real problem is with the stakeholders and understanding or trying to understand what is, is useful for this uh, uh, stakeholder. And what you have to add with that is that it's not about an individual stakeholder communicating with an individual firm. Let's say uh, if you uh, are a bank and uh, you want to uh, speak with the, the auditor of uh, an individual uh, a company, you can ask any question you want. Uh, there's no problem with privacy. There's no problem with uh, uh, secrecy, nothing. But then you have no uh, way to compare firms. You have no distance like you have with the audit quality indicators. The, the, the thought about the indicators is that you can have a, a comparable data over the entire market. Uh, one of the things you will find is that the interpretation of an indicator is, is, is a problem. Let's give me some example and, and something you just will find. You could ask, uh, what is the percentage of audit hours um, uh, spent by the IT audit staff? And you can give that percentage. But what does it mean? When is it enough? When is it too much? When is it too little? And is more better or is less better? Uh, for example, there are firms that say, uh, if we have more IT audit staff, that shows that we are happy to uh, spend uh, the, the extra mile uh, and, and the extra uh, euro uh, on more expensive stuff. Other firms say, well, if I need more IT audit stuff, it shows that my normal audit stuff is not capable enough. So less IT audit is better because it shows a better a team. And well, Tell me, I, I, I don't know. I can I can measure the percentage, but I can't give the interpretation. So that's something you will find with anything you do on this uh, subject. It's the, the interpretation is, is very hard. And if you want to make a system where you can have, like in the Netherlands, about 300 firms that have to be uh, uh, to give comparable information, 
uh, you have uh, you have a challenge, a real challenge. I can definitely see that. So many thanks for that good advice. Uh, very interesting. Now to um, round off our um, interview, uh, maybe you could tell us uh, in uh, two minutes uh, what is what is what is next. What what is left? What uh, will happen uh, next in the Netherlands? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> at this moment, uh, the working party has delivered uh, our uh, proposal to the uh, quartermasters. They have changed a bit. Uh, they have added uh, one uh, more uh, indicator about ESG, which was uh, uh, quite a, a surprise, uh, I can say. Um, but being one of the main subjects for the future, uh, I understand why they uh, added uh, this one, but that was beyond the uh, working party. The complete set is now uh, uh, proposed by the quartermasters to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, he, and uh, since we had a new government, she has to uh, adopt them, uh, have to go to Parliament with it so it can become law. Uh, and then, well, we have to uh, set up a system where information is collected, uh, indicators will be uh, published. Uh, we will have to have some kind of oversight about uh, maintaining the definitions, interpretations, review after a few years, um, uh, some kind of oversight on the quality of the quality indicators themselves. Uh, are the firms uh, producing the correct information? And then at some point there will have to be an evaluation if it all made sense, if, if it has some effect because, uh, well, like I started, it's, it's not useful if nobody does anything with them. At this moment, it, it, it looks like the uh, professional body will be the organization that will uh, collect and maintain uh, this information. But that's not sure because, well, it still uh, has to go to Parliament. OK, good. Um, so there is definitely more work to do. Uh, Arnold, many thanks for your intervention. A very useful and um, we would say all the best of luck with the AQIs in the Netherlands. Thanks Thank again. You. Very good. So an indirect big thank you to, to Arnold van, uh, van Kempen for, for this insight into the work uh, going on in the Netherlands for the quartermasters. So our next presenters uh, uh, are actually two presenters. So we are now joined by Thiago Ferreira, uh, and uh, Goretti Amaral. Uh, they are both from the Portuguese Securities uh, Market Commission, the CMVM. Uh, Tiago uh, was uh, the coordinator of the Audit Supervision Department and has recently, since 2020, uh, been appointed as, a, as the director of that department. Uh, and Tiago has a, a background in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the Big Four. And Goretti uh, works as a senior officer of the audit supervision department and uh, has also a background in, uh, in the audit profession. So, uh, Tiago and Goretti, um, thank you very much for joining us and uh, I look forward to hearing your, your presentation. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank you the invitations of Accountants Europe for this initiative that we consider very useful to improve the audit process. During this webinar, me and my colleague Maria Goretti, we try to share the CMVM experience about the AQI uh, model that was developed uh, since uh, 2019. So first of all, uh, next slide, please. Um, why we develop uh, audit quality indicators? So the, the AQI model produced by CMVM uh, will allow to obtain regular, structured, and adequate information to several factors that contribute the promotion of audit quality for different stakeholders. We know that the concept, the concept of audit quality is complex and is composed by several aspects, such as law and regulation framework, inputs given by audit clients, culture, factor, and so on. Although AQI2, or our model, try to structure some critical aspects that contribute for audit quality. 
So basically, we anticipate six uh, AQI objects, but I would like two of them. The first one is promote a quality culture inside audit firm. AQI model help audit firm establish critical criteria in the same playground fields that are useful to different stakeholders. We know that audit firms has already key PIs or key performance indicators that are frequently used, like the March profits and so on. And what about quality? So we try to define <clears throat> some indicators that could be uh, compared between some firms. Of course, during our work, and I will uh, walk through the timetable, uh, we try to simplify and go and cap the principal data. And the second one uh, objective that I would like to highlight is uh, uh, AQI model or AQI tool is uh, 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 allow us a, a more focused supervision by CMVM in auditors' performance. So nowadays, uh, uh, supervisor needs to have a quicker response or reaction. Uh, so the AQI is a good tool to detect trigger or risks to uh, 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 understand near to uh, the auditors. So. We, we have our model uh, translate to English in our site. This is uh, uh, the link to the model, to, to our, our document. Uh, next slide, please. So how we develop the AKI model uh, and when? So first of all, uh, we start to analyze the available information published by FAC and other jurisdictions like PCOB, CAC, Netherlands, Singapore, PCOB uh, in uh, 2019. After that, we made some interactions with Big Six in Portugal to obtain and understand the, the type of information that uh, the, the Big Six used to, to monitoring the audit quality. And after that, we constitute a working group to debate, this working group was uh, composed by uh, several stakeholders like other regulators, uh, audit committee representatives, uh, and so on. And we made nine brainstorming to debate, discuss the most uh, important indicators in Portuguese market. After that, uh, uh, and we will see in timeline, we try to define a, a simple model. It's composed by eight indicators. Um, and in the first uh, stage, we uh, select a simple uh, uh, sample. So basically, uh, we request data from big six in the early stage and 25 projects. Um, this approach by phase or in the best in force uh, allow us to understand the difficulties of audit firms, allow to understand to calibrate the model, and allows each year to evaluate if the indicators are useful for a majority of stakeholders. Next slide, please. So the timeline, as I refer, we start the work at February in 2019 with definition of TORS. We made the development of preliminary AKI model, we made a market consultation. We received uh, a lot of comments uh, from, uh, from uh, audit firms. Uh, we, we analyzed that, that comments and we published the first versions in February of 2020. So uh, after that, we received the first data, the first report at September of 2020. Next slide, please, sorry. <clears throat> And um, we, we analyzed the first data, as, uh, as I mentioned. Um, sorry, Amanda, can you move for the, the, the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So we, we, we analyzed the results and we propose uh, adapt the model, uh, a, a, a small adjustment regarding to with two indicators. And we publish a first update model in April 2021. 
So in July 2022, we received the second data. We, we did the second data uh, uh, of AQIs. We uh, collect some uh, uh, views of audit committees <laughs> uh, to understand the relevance of uh, uh, our AQIs. Um, and nowadays, we are preparing uh, an, a new update of our model that we will include uh, probably a, a new section to describe other indicators could be useful for other stakeholders. So, uh, next slide, please. Of course, during the the, the project, uh, we have several questions. We have a couple of questions here. Uh, we have seven questions that we want to discuss. Uh, however, in the benefit of time, I would like three of them. First of all, and this is a frequently question, is how is data quality is insurance by the audit firms? So this is a... a, a a risk that we, we we debate, we discussed, and we understand that the, it's critical that the firms implement uh, uh, appropriate internal quality control. So during this this process, we discussed with audit firms uh, what which kind of controls was implemented and guaranteed that there are a review process at the top level. Of course, during our supervisions, we try to collect information to guarantee or to check if the data was reported to CMVM uh, are completed and uh, uh, um, and uh, occur. The other question that I would uh, uh, um, discuss is: Is there are risks of AQIs being misunderstood by third parties? Of course, there are. And as Vanessa, I think, already mentioned, uh, and other panelists, uh, AQIs needs to uh, uh, accompany with explanation and contextualization. So in our model, and we define specific indicators, we, it's mandatory the auditors report us explanation for each indicator. So. This explanation allows uh, CMVM as a supervisor or uh, audit committees to understand why the firms not involved, for instance, IT specialists. So the explanation for each indicator is very important. And the third one, before I pass the, the floor to Goretti, is, uh, is there a risk that audit firms we will work to achieve certain AQI values. This is the next slide, please. Yes, we know that we probably some uh, audit firms will work to achieve some benchmarks like 3% or 5% of engagement department involvement. So our objective is not the uh, audit firms to achieve some benchmarks. Our goal is to give a tool to the market to monitoring some critical aspects. So until now, we not uh, disclose any uh, quantitative uh, results. We only disclose in Portuguese market some qualitative results, tenders, uh, perceptions, risks. And of course, we will probably uh, uh, evolve the, the, the each year if we have good insurance if the data will not create a, a, a danger situation that is uh, firms will work to achieve certain AQI values. So, uh, Goretti, if you want to, uh, Michael, you will present briefly uh, the eight indicators and the, some correlations and some discussion that we have during the, the stage of working. Goretti, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, please. Okay. Uh, our model uh, uh, includes eight indicators uh, as presented in this slide, and uh, they incorporate 15 uh, metrics uh, on aspects that we uh, considered uh, that are particularly relevant in promoting audit uh, quality. 
Uh, our model includes both uh, the quantitative dimension of the audit activity, but also uh, qualitative aspects uh, on uh, how the profession is exercised. Uh, in the following slides, I will give you uh, a, a flavor <laughs> of the quantitative uh, indicators that are included in our uh, model. So there are eight indicators uh, uh, and uh, four of them, uh, three of them uh, are at firm and engagement level. Uh, the indicators are audit hours, uh, partner workload and experience. And uh, given the nature of some indicators, uh, their application is only suitable at one perspective. For instance, there is four indicators that are only applicable at firm level. Uh, uh, they are training, turnover of employees, uh, results of internal and external quality controls and quality control functions. And the last one, hours per audit phases, uh, is only applicable at engagement level. Amanda, if you please, uh, to the next slide. OK, uh, from our analysis of the many indicators that we could uh, choose, uh, we uh, decided for these eight uh, upon uh, their relevance uh, and their correlation with audit quality. So uh, in the first uh, to in relation to the first uh, indicator, audit hours, uh, there is a positive correlation uh, between the audit quality and the degree uh, of involvement of the senior members. Obviously, uh, uh, with higher degree of involvement of managers, of uh, uh, partners, uh, that implies that uh, uh, it is uh, there is an increased supervision and review of the work done by the less experienced members of the engagement team. In relation to the second indicator, partner workload, uh, this indicator uh, permits to uh, evaluate uh, the, the availability of the audit, audit engagement uh, partner to monitor and to review the audit engagements uh, in a timely manner, uh, taking into consideration all the audit engagements uh, that is uh, under his responsibility. Obviously, that uh, if a partner has a heavy workload, uh, did, this could lead to uh, uh, um, uh, not to uh, to him to address uh, the, their attention, their focus to all uh, audit engagements under his uh, responsibility, and therefore there could be a negative impact on audit uh, quality. In what concerns the third indicator experience, uh, 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 there is a positive correlation between the number uh, of years of experience in audit and the audit quality. Obviously, auditors with more experience and obviously, obviously more training are more capable of performing and defining uh, an audit strategy that fits the risks and the context of the audit entities. Amanda, if you please, next slide. In what concerns training, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, uh, if the uh, auditors have uh, more uh, training, adequate training, up-to-date uh, knowledge, obviously, obviously, they will be more capable uh, to uh, identify the risks and to address uh, the risks in a proper way. Uh, so, in order to uh, carry out high-quality uh, uh, audits. In what concerns the turnover of employees, uh, a high turnover in audit teams can have a negative impact on audit quality uh, because uh, accumulated knowledge and experience on the clients and on the business of the uh, audited entities uh, are, are not properly consolidated and there is high turnover. 
obviously that uh, I tur uh, uh, some turnover is expected, but when it is uh, 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 when it is um, uh, a large amount of uh, members of an uh, engagement team that could uh, 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 give a, a, a less audit quality. The hours per audit phases, uh, we uh, consider that the audit quality also depends on the proper planning and execution uh, and how well the overall audit hours are faced. So uh, we consider that the uh, hours dedicated to the planning phase are critical and is also relevant to know whether the senior members, the more experienced members, participate in the definition uh, of the audit strategy uh, and in all the uh, planning phase. Amanda, please, if you please. The results of internal and external quality controls, we consider also that uh, have a, a, a positive uh, impact on audit quality uh, as the uh, firm's internal control um, quality control program can demonstrate uh, its level uh, of attention to quality monitoring and improvement in audit practice. And also the results of external monitoring, particularly the, the number and the nature of the recommendations related to the audit firm's internal control uh, system corroborate whether the system is appropriate. And also the evolution uh, in the number and the nature uh, of the findings, both internal and external uh, quality controls, may, may be an indicator of uh, audit quality because comparative information uh, may permit to access the, direc the direction of the uh, firm's attention uh, into improving audit quality. And the last uh, indicator that is included in our model is quality control functions. Uh, this indicator uh, permits to access the audit firm's commitment to allocate centralized resources in order to provide engagement teams with the tools, knowledge and necessary resources required to perform quality audits uh, in a consistent manner. Tiago, back to you. You're on mute, Tiago. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. So uh, thank you, David. Uh, so basically, uh, a wrap up that we believe that AQI is a fundamental part to monitoring the audit quality. Uh, we know that there are no, uh, there are, as as Vanessa mentioned, there are no uh, silver bullet, but uh, AQI model that are composed by different indicators could be a good tool to see or to kept uh, uh, useful information for different stakeholders. Um, we know that probably there are a, a substantial part of audit work that have a judgmental aspects. Uh, however, the stakeholders needs to guarantee, needs guarantee and needs more transparency about uh, key elements like the department, uh, the partner of engagement was involved or not to discuss the uh, principal issues or not. Uh, so uh, in our experience, and of course we already uh, an, uh, analyzed, we, we already made an analysis of two years of data, we can conclude that AQI is a useful tool uh, to compare some audit firms, to identify risks, to identify tenders, to anticipate some questions and the tenders in the future. Of course, this is our view as a supervisor, but we know that audit committees uh, and, and based on the survey that we made, uh, most of uh, eight, eight uh, AQIs that we define, audit committees define as a relevance, a good uh, 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 tool to inquire uh, uh, the, uh, the auditors to guarantee in the in the selection process that compare the firms not only by KPIs but also AQIs in the same playground field. That is very, very important. Uh, 
Vanessa also uh, uh, referred one thing that is how we compare the firms. So that uh, exercise we made uh, during uh, the whole process to guarantee is that we try to define some terms. What is a senior? What is the engagement? What, so we try to create in our model some definition to promote the comparisons of data. So if you look for our model, in each indicator, we define some aspects that we know that each firm treats as uh, uh, probably uh, want. <laughs> so uh, 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 the, the last message, and then before we go through to, to panelist uh, discussion, uh, is we believe that AQI is the future, is not a, a, a static uh, tool. We will develop an uh, basis on market needs. Uh, of course, we can incorporate more indicators. However, we, we, we know that when we put a lot of indicators, probably the analysis we will confuse. So uh, in this stage, we prefer eight indicators to capture and to uh, allow all uh, pies, uh, audit firms, pies, to prepare data, to obtain data. So we will working by stage to guarantee that all auditors uh, in Portugal uh, have indicators in the firms. Thank you, David. Thank you Thank very you much, much, Sergio and, uh, and Jureti. Um, really interesting to have the perspective of a capital market regulator supervisor. So it was really interesting and we'll come back no doubt to some of the points you've uh, you've made in the panel discussion. We, we are going to conclude this uh, series of presentation now with uh, Joachim Schindler. So Joachim, very good to, to have you with us. Uh, Joachim, you're currently the Audit Committee Chair of Sal Salgitar uh, AG in Germany. Your background is with KPMG, where you held uh, very senior positions, notably uh, International Head of Audit uh, for KPMG International. Uh, you are also chairman of uh, ID, uh, IDV in um, in uh, in Germany for for ten years, or at least you were we, uh, on the board of IDV for for ten years, uh, and now you have a, uh, a what we call a plural career on on various um, supervisory boards, uh, notably as as I said with Sal Salskita, um, also with Rocket Internet uh, or with CMBIU. Uh, you're a Wirtschaftsprüfer and a Steuerberater, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as must be said, and um, really, really keen and interested to hear your perspective from an audit committee chairman point of view. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, David, um, for, for this kind introduction. Um, so, I mean, as you pointed out, I'm, I'm not part of any standard set or even or any organization. I'm, I really speak here for myself um, based off what I'm doing um, nowadays and um, my experience, of course, also as an auditor. Um, I have prepared just two slides um, to help you follow what I'm talking about. So um, let's continue, Amanda, with the, with the first slide. Um, so why is audit quality important for audit committees? And for some years already, the German Corporate Governance Code required audit committees to monitor audit quality. Um, as a reaction of the Wirecard scandal, which some of you may have heard of, a law was passed last year in Germany in order to strengthen the um, integrity of the financial markets. And as part of this, um, the requirement for audit committees to monitor audit quality was included in the law. Um, the government said um, this addition to the law was only of a clarifying nature, but there's enough anecdotal evidence, I would say, um, that in the past audit committees have not regarded monitoring of audit quality as, as an important part of their work. Anyway, now it is clear from the law, however, um, the even more important relevance of audit quality for audit committees, from my perspective at least, is connected to the role of auditors for the work of audit committees. 
One of the tasks of audit committees is to oversee the financial reporting or the external reporting by the company, which nowadays is the financial and the non-financial reporting. And I think one can clearly say that this is the most important role of audit committees. Um, and in Germany, this is demonstrated by the fact that the supervisory board um, and the audit committee is a committee of the supervisory board um, has to review. I mean, I hesitate to call it an audit, although in the in the law it says um, the supervisory board has to audit um, the financial statements and the audit committee has a preparatory role for this. Um, this does not mean that um, a second audit has to be done um, in addition to what the statutory auditor does. Um, the audit committee and um, the supervisory board have to rely on the auditors and this reliance is only possible if um, <clears throat> if the audit committee knows and trusts that a high quality audit was performed. So in in essence, um, the auditors are the only external party that provides the audit committee with an independent view on a regular basis. So on the one hand side, I would say I welcome the change of the law introduced last year, but even without that change, audit committees would have to assess audit quality in order to fulfill their role. <coughs> um, so when has audit quality to be assessed by the audit committee? Um, it has to be an important factor in a tender process, but it has also to be looked at on an annual basis. And during the tender process, the assessment necessarily is based on presentations and documents um, rather than on experience during an audit. Um, this is different in the review of audit quality after the performance of the audit work. And therefore, in the annual process, and it has to be an annual process, the audit committee has much more evidence on which to be based um, the assessment. <clears throat> so let's focus on the question, what do we mean by audit quality? And I mean, we heard already quite a lot about this area. Um, I mean, there is no definition of audit quality available, neither in the academic world nor in practice, although the term is widely used. And in my understanding, audit quality means adherence to national and international auditing standards in order to make sure that financial statements provide a true and fair view. Because this is what um, the audit committee and the um, the public at large is relying upon. And in this context, um, it has to be taken into account that um, the decision of an auditor when the collected evidence is sufficient to reach a conclusion is not a mathematical but a judgmental one. And likewise, audit quality cannot be defined in a mathematical or scientific sense through the use of quantitative aspects alone. Um, and the three bullets I put here on the slide, they play a very important role from my perspective. Firstly, the ability of the auditors to detect material misstatements, and this includes technical competence, experience, proper organizational measures. And secondly, an appropriate judgment process based upon professional standards, which usually implies a risk-based audit focused on risks of material misstatements. And thirdly, an unbiased judgment, which includes in particular a questioning mind, professional skepticism, independence. And the fact that this is not visible from the outside, I mean, basically all of this um, makes the assessment of audit quality so difficult. And the audit committee is relatively far away from the audit process, which happens between the auditors and the audited company. 
Um, and all of these considerations have to be taken into account when determining, determining indicators for audit quality. <clears throat> so let's go now to, to the main aspect from my perspective, which are the relevant indicators. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the various, or at least of various initiatives, certainly not all of them, um, that where people have come up with audit quality indicators. Um, to some degree, they are fairly similar, um, but to some extent views differ. Um, not surprisingly, because um, um, regulators in some respect have a different perspective compared to um, audit firms or academia. Often indicators are quantitative. For example, the relative hours or relative portion of hours performed by specialists. And uh, those ratios are without any doubt a good indicator in their field. <clears throat> but for a comprehensive view, qualitative factors are evenly important. If not, that would be my perspective, if not more important. I mean, you can call them soft factors. And um, what I found interesting was um, the list the um, UK FRC have come up with, um, um, which is about mindset and cultures, skills, character and knowledge quality control and judgment. Um, and behind many of those, you talk about personal characteristics, like attitude, character, ability for appropriate judgments, as well as effective communication. Um, and all of those are not quantitatively measurable, but still they are a fundamental element or fundamental elements of audit quality. So nothing against the use of quantitative ratios, but that would not be sufficient from my perspective to assess audit quality. Both quantitative and qualitative aspects have to be taken into account. And some indicator, um, we heard this already, referred to the audit firm level, some to the engagement level. For me as an audit committee chair, um, the concrete engagement is more interesting, although some indicators on audit firm level allow conclusions um, on the audit firm's quality control system, for example. <clears throat> um, I think one has to also bear in mind that audit quality indicators are not absolute. Um, they can be ambiguous. Um, for example, a large number of yearly training hours of an engagement team gives a positive impression as such, but it can also indicate a rather junior team. Um, so it's it can be good or not so good. So therefore, the indicator or ratio can only form the basis for discussion between the audit committee and, and the auditors. <clears throat> um, what I have done is, and, and this is my sort of personal view of, of the way I deal with this whole question of assessment of audit quality, um, I put together a questionnaire which I use and, and I listed here on the slides um, a number of points. Um, I will briefly go through them. And these are also, um, from my perspective, audit quality indicators. Um, so audit team, it's about technical accounting knowledge, industry knowledge, understanding the business, um, worldwide management, um, time spent by the lead audit partner, involvement of specialists, etc. The second part is about audit strategy and planning. <clears throat> Um, this is about risks of material misstatements, um, where I would emphasize um, the importance of explaining this to audit committee members who are often not 
as familiar um, with this term, what this really means. Then the whole area of materiality, um, the various aspects, quantitative side, qualitative side, overall materiality, performance materiality, breakdown of group materiality to subsidiaries, etc. Um, then what are the focus areas and, and the use of IT tools? Um, regarding the audit performance, um, I look at adherence to the agreed timetable, any outsourcing to internal departments within the firm, involvement of a national office, for example, but other parts as well. Um, then the question, was the dealing with the critical accounting areas appropriate, both from the companies um, and the audit committee's point of view? Um, were internal quality reviews done? Um, um, <clears throat> were there any different views between management and auditors? Um, what about results of external oversight bodies, um, but also the hours um, performed by senior members of the audit team? Um, <clears throat> then about the audit results, um, early and comprehensive information, um, of course, in particular about risks of material misstatement, um, audit differences, the recorded ones, the unrecorded ones, and weaknesses in uh, in the accounting process in in the internal control system. And finally, a very important point is a complete set around the communication. Um, <clears throat> a, a final word. Um, <clears throat> um, I would say most of this is reflects the experience with the audit team, so is more of a quantitative nature. Um, but from my perspective, all the answers together give a pretty robust picture um, whether a high quality audit um, um, has been performed. And of course, um, additional information um, about um, the internal quality control process within the firm and about independence um, adds to this. Um, but this is not so much a question of a this single audit, but um, more something the audit committee has to look at um, in addition. And in terms of process, um, this, this is something which the audit committee cannot do on its own. Um, the questionnaire I use includes questions for management and questions for the audit committee so that, um, that the views of the management is also taken into account um, and from from that overall feedback, um, the summary is prepared, and and this is what the CFO and I, as the chairman of the audit committee, discuss with the auditors, and then present to the audit committee um, in the next meeting. So far, I think I've basically kept to my 15 minutes. Very good, Joachim. Thank you very much. I mean. Uh... A uh, very interesting perspective. We 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 have a, 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 a very short break now, um, and what I'm proposing to do there is to keep it quite brief because we have a lot of questions on the Slido. Thank you very much for for this. We are definitely not going to be able to cover them all, but you can vote for your preferred questions on Slido. So please do so, and we will. Uh, I will do my best to try and cover at least the top three or four uh, questions that come up uh, there. So please um, uh, vote. We take a two-minute break. Um, so it's uh, 23 past the hour. We will restart exactly at 25 past the hour. Uh, so stretch your legs, and uh, we are back together in uh, just two minutes. Thank you.
Very good. So I suggest we, we start again. Um, and for this panel discussion, um, please that we uh, we will have uh, the, the pleasure of having with us uh, Vanessa, Tiago and Maria and, and Joachim uh, that uh, you, you have seen before. Uh, and uh, because Arnold could, could not be with us today, uh, we have a, a, a guest speaker um, who is Ferry van Leyen. Uh, Ferry joins us uh, for this panel discussion. Um, Ferry is with uh, Deloitte. Uh, he has a interesting ba background in marketing and communication, not 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 in audit, but he has extensive experience with uh, audit quality related projects, uh, and notably in his current role where he's, he's leading the AQI pilot project that has been mentioned before by Arnott in uh, in uh, in the Netherlands on uh, mon the mandatory implementation of AQIs for the uh, eight audit firms. So uh, very very pleased uh, to have to have you with us for for this panel discussion. Thank you, Dave. So we have lots of questions, lots of questions on Slido. Uh, I think uh, our our speakers have covered. Uh, already a number of uh, of the questions that uh, are on the Slido, but not not all of them. So let's let's see how uh, how we can cover as much as we can in the next thirty minutes uh, or so. I'll start with asking um, you know each of our panelists uh, a, a simple question. I think if if you can, uh, as best you can, try and answer the questions uh, briefly so that we can. Um, we can we can cover uh, as many themes as as possible, uh, and I, I wanted to start with uh, with our uh, panel panelists from uh, CMVM, uh, and wanted to ask you um, what 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 are the, the key lessons you have learned from uh, this two year project. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of those on the, uh, in the participants who may want to start a similar project. Sort of what, what what would be your advice to them uh, based on what you've you've done? So thank you, thank you, David, for for the question. It's a good question. We, we take a, a lot of lessons. In fact, <laughs> it's not one lesson. It's a lot of lessons. But I, I would like to to highlight one or two. First of all, uh, the AQIs give us a potential, uh, of course, in the perspective of supervisors. A potential data useful to have a quicker reaction about the risks or triggers and have is a good tool to uh, overview from some critical aspects of course this is the, the main lesson so basically we are happy with the results we know that we have a, a, a walk through to 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 go because we know that the data that we receive, we need to make tests. We need to guarantee that PIEs, audit firms, have internal control systems adequate to guarantee uh, uh, quality and completeness of data. Um, in terms of development of the model, uh, one of critical aspects that uh, I would like to highlight is the give time to audit firms to establish a gradual process. So basically, uh, in the first stage, we ask the best in force from audit firms. It's necessary because some data, some quantitative data and some qualitative data are not in the system. So the work to collect and systemize is huge, and we understand that. Of course, the AQIs needs to implement it by stage. Uh, our model in this stage is applied to PIEs auditors, some PIEs auditors, of course, is our intention to increase the, the, the scope for all PIE auditors. But the first lesson is give the time the audit firms to establish, create expectation, create the field to guarantee that uh, the main definitions are correctly understandable by the market and the second one and, and I, I will not and, and I will stop now I, I'm not <laughs> I continue to talk about this um, is a, 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 as I mentioned is is a tool to contribute to more efficient supervision and is a tool to promote 
uh, debate in terms of quality. It's the same la language. So if uh, I'm supervisor, talk with audit committees about, for instance, the involvement of uh, engagement partner or involvement of IT specialists or the workload of partners, we know the same language. And is a tool, and I remember when I read the CAC studies since 2014 and so on, this is a useful tool uh, uh, for audit committees. Audit committees need to support, need to compare some quality. How audit committee compare if uh, the investment that uh, audit firms made in, the, for instance, in training, how compare this? We know these have risk. We know, as Joaquin referred, uh, if a firm spend 100 hours in training and another 100 hours, what is meaning? And because of that, we defend that each indicator needs to uh, explanation, uh, a contextualization to understand what kind of training was measured, was certified or not. So this is this is a, 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 the, the analysis. But first stage, we need data, and the audit market needs to uh, spread data to make more transparency in their work. Sorry, David. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Let, let's explore some of this a uh, little bit, a uh, little bit more. So, I'll, I'll, I'd like to bring Ferry into the the discussion. Um, and Ferry, I mean, one of one of the comments Tiago made was on you know the the the, the need for the firms to prepare for audit quality indicators. What 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 are you seeing in the market in terms of how the firms are preparing for for this, especially yeah. in the Netherlands? Thank you, David. Um, what we are currently doing in the Netherlands, and what I and which project I'm leading currently is a pilot of the AQIs that Arnaud van Kempen just mentioned. There are 11 a AQIs uh, proposed by the Ministry of Finance, and we are currently piloting these uh, eight AQIs with eight different audit firms, and that's under the umbrella of the professional body MBA. And those firms are small and large, um, and we are trying uh, and our goal or our objective is to look at the AQI definitions set by the working group of Arnaut and see if our interpretation is the same, for example. Um, but also we would like to get experience with data collection because as these will be mandatory probably by 2023, uh, our officers uh, have to provide the data as well. So if we can get early experience with it, that would be helpful, of course. Um, but we also want to look and discuss the outcome of the AQIs with stakeholders, also external stakeholders. Like Arnaud mentioned, there isn't really big, there hasn't been a big debate with external stakeholders if they see these AQIs or the outcome of the AQIs as beneficial for their roles. So we want to, to have this discussion with external stakeholders as well. Um, and on the other hand, what Arnaud also mentioned is professional body NBA will probably be the party that is going to collect and publish the, the outcome of the, collect the data and publish the outcome of the AQIs. This will give them first-hand experience, of course, as well. And when, when we look at our pilot and what experience we currently have is that although the document that the working group of Arnaut has, has delivered is very detailed. Definitions need to be defined in a very, very detailed way. Because what we're currently encountering is that uh, when we look at a definition of an AQI, uh, there will be different interpretations of these AQIs and or of the definition. And therefore, you can't really compare the outcome of the AQI. So, that is a bit of a, a bit of a difficulty uh, uh, what we're currently dealing with, and we we are preparing also some sort of guidance. We don't want to make it set in stone, for example, but make some sort of guidance for uh, the other firms that are going to implement these AQIs as well. And one of the other things that we also encounter availability of data will always be an issue, whether you're a large audit firm or a small audit firm. What we see at large audit firms, they have systems based on history and legacy, and therefore these systems aren't really flexible. And what you see that the smaller firms, they have less systems, 
but therefore data or the resources to get the data are also a problem. So that is a, that, that is difficult uh, um, uh, difficulties in, in both the larger and the smaller firms. And and what I also would like to urge, if your country is looking at AQIs, always look what is already reported by audit firms. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a mandatory uh, transparency report with a couple of uh, uh, quality indicators already in there for the PI licensed audit firms. So there is already quite some material available and you don't want to double or stack up the, the, the measures for reporting and that way it will be unclear for stakeholders as well. So David, that, what, that was something that I want to give back to the group. That's very, very useful. Thank you, Sari. So let, let's move. Let's now move to the uh, the other topic that um, that Thiago mentioned on the audit committee side. And uh, Vanessa, you uh, you have done a, a survey of audit committees uh, on on this on this topic. Can you can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure. Thank you. Uh, we co-authored uh, with Deloitte actually um, a survey of audit committees uh, last year. We published our report in January 2022, and it was a general. Um, survey of audit committee practices, um, but we did naturally, being the Center for Audit Quality, ask not so much about AQIs, but we asked the question about um, what contributes to audit quality. And I think not surprising based on this discussion and agree with so much of, of what's been said and, and appreciate um, Yakim, your, your comments from the audit committee perspective, um, which, which we agree with strongly. So the response, the highest um, response for what contributes to audit quality is strong communication between the engagement partner and the audit committee. Um, and we did hear anecdotally with the increased, um, with the pandemic and the remote environment, there was actually some increase in frequency of communication. So again, that didn't focus exactly, we didn't ask the question about, is there a dashboard or there are specific metrics, but that communication, that tone from the audit committee contributes strongly to audit quality. Um, and then competence of the engagement team was the other leading contributor, which I think goes to many of the questions uh, that Yakim had on his slides. Um, the experience, um, it was less about turnover, but confidence of the engagement team. And and this, those were the top two. Um, some of the other factors, not surprisingly, were quality of the firm resources, including the national office, strong professional skepticism of the engagement team, and project management. So, you know, a number of the characteristics uh, that I think the indicators discussed here today um, get added a little bit more, more measure. Thank you, Vanessa. So, I mean, you, Akim, you, you covered some of these topics in, in your earlier presentation. Um, I don't know if you, you have anything to add on, uh, on, on this matter, but yeah, I, I'd be quite interested uh, in addition to, to, to any comments you may have on, on this to also explore uh, with you whether, um, you know, if, if, if we are trying to measure audit quality, is the quality of governance, for example, in, a, in, in, a, in, in an entity, not in a way an indicator of audit quality and and is there anything that companies can also do on their side to contribute to that audit quality uh, uh, indicator process be interested in your thoughts on that <clears throat> you, you 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 mean governance of the firms or no of, of the company being audited <clears throat> um well i'm i think there there, there is a strong aspect to that <laughs> Quite, quite openly, um, because at the end of the day, um, I think audit quality is not, at least from an audit committee perspective, is not something which is purely on the side of the auditors, um, but where um, the audit committee and, and also the management, the company has, has a role to play. Um, um, I mean, for the audit committee, it starts um, with the knowledge about auditing um, because I mean from my perspective a lot of this discussion um, is based on the difficulty and I think somebody said this um, earlier today um, that um, in a way you can say auditing is a black box for many people and quite frankly I think for most companies 
Um, and therefore, firstly, I think you need somebody on the audit committee who really understands auditing from a practical perspective, basically having worked in audit for at least a number of years. Um, because only then you can have a level playing field discussion with the auditors. Um, and then the question is how, how interested is or how engaged is an audit committee, but also a management with the audit. Um, and, and only if that is the case, um, um, the audit committee can do really full, can, can fulfill its role. Because I mean, Nim, take take a simple point. Um, the audit reporting is delayed. Um, I mean, that may be the fault of the auditor, maybe, but it may be the fault of the company because they they have presented their figures um, with a lot of delay, and then the auditors, of course, cannot report um, in a time on a timely basis. And um, if an audit committee doesn't understand that. Um, I mean the the discussion may stop at the auditors and and the and and the real cause which is on the side of the company will not be addressed um, so I think um, absolutely I mean the governance um, the processes of of the audited company is so important also to audit quality thank you Joachim Ferry did you, did you want to add anything to this yes a good point that you raised David um, when you look at the AQIs that are being used in Canada, for example, there has been quite a good pilot with AQIs that are being used in a way that it's a talking point between uh, the audit committee on the one side, the auditor on the other side, and management by the audited entity on the on the third side. And there are also uh, audit quality indicators designed uh, for the management of the company that is being audited. Are they preparing their information at a timely basis? And and if not, uh, uh, it's a point of discussion where the audit committee could also uh, get involved. Thank so you, that was uh, what I would like to add. That's really, really useful. Thank you. One of the, I mean, the the winner uh, uh, of of this afternoon, I, the question that got the most votes on uh, on Slido is a question about uh, the, uh, ex the assurance to be provided on uh, audit quality indicators. Um, so I, I, I'd like to do, you know, direct the question to no one in particular, but any, anyone who wants to jump in on that. And uh, I think there was a reference to the audit quality indicators being sort of verified by the regulator, uh, or should it be part of the audit process and a part of the audited accounts of the of the audit firm um, or any other way to provide the market some assurance that these numbers are not made up and we don't have a AQI washing of some kind. David, if Anyone? I may start, um, when you look at the Netherlands, the, uh, the scope of the audit quality indicators will be the audit firms with a specific license that is uh, the license is distributed by our regulator. So uh, the AQIs will become a part of the license and therefore it will also be or it could be a topic of of uh, inspection uh, I would say uh, I'm not sure if the uh, audit regulator wants to go that far but it's part of the license so it, it could be a, a point of discussion there yes <clears throat> can I David to, to increase a couple of Please. ideas so <laughs> That is one of the, the challenge and the question that we we I already presented of data quality is a, a trigger is a, is a issue of course. So uh, the data should be uh, or the problem should be see in the different views. First of all, the audit firm should be have internal quality control. As Vanessa mentioned, ISKM one have a, a sharper a section and probably the most of uh, participants will know that is monitoring. So the first key is guarantee that audit firm have a review process of AQIs as have KPIs. Of course, KPIs is a commercial indicators and probably uh, partners are looking more margin cost. 
but should be also look for a key why. So in our uh, 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 debate with big six firms in Portugal, we try to understand if which kind of controls the audit firms implemented. And basically, we understand that all data, uh, all data or all re results was reviewed by CEOs or some partners to guarantee that the results are uh, according with the expectations. But we understand that supervisor should be included in the scope, the data that was reported. So we, uh, in our uh, on-site supervision, we include in this, uh, this aspect the data quality in our scope to guarantee that the data was reported to us was uh, uh, appropriate and are completed. So it's a mixed process. But the first one, audit firm should be have internal control review process. That is the key aspect to guarantee data. Thank you. Thank you. In my point of view, of course. <laughs> Thank you. And Joachim, does it make any difference for you as audit committee chairman whether there is some form of assurance or that uh, you, I mean, what's your view on this in terms of a recipient of the information? Well, I mean, I, I would be very hesitant to um, go that far um, because um, that would mean that we really talk about um, in a way, a kind of what I would call a mathematical definition of audit quality. So you count one, two, three, four, five, and if you have, if you're by five, then audit quality is is a given. <clears throat> um, I think we are talking here about indicators, and indicators are something which is the basis for discussion. And and um, there are a lot of good indicators, but but I don't think we should try to reach a stage where we say, OK, now quality can be counted upon. Um, because, um, I mean, th I think this 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 is a this would be, from my perspective, a difficult road to go go at or go to. And, um, and I, I would not rely on this um, as an audit committee chair because um, <clears throat> Um, firstly, I mean, that would be something on a firm level. And I mean, I'm looking at my engagement team um, rather than on what the firm does. And I mean, I agree completely with Tiago that um, I want to know what are the quality control procedures within a firm. Um, and, and I want somebody external or regulated to look at that. That gives me assurance. But um, I think there, I think we should stop, and and then we have to deal with it, basically case by case, because otherwise, I think we we give the impression to the marketplace um, here you can rely upon quality, and and I think this is audit is a too complex, um, let's say procedure or process um, that this would be possible from my perspective. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to bring Dorothy and uh, and Vanessa into in, into the discussion on on the topic again that that come that has come through strongly on Slido, which is the issue of uh, of whether there is a one size fits all approach to audit quality indicators, uh, or whether, as some have suggested on 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 Slido, the audit quality indicators need to be adapted notably to the sort of audit being performed. You know, if you're auditing in the US uh, Coca-Cola, do you need the same sort of audit quality indicators as if as if you're auditing a sort of a, a, a much, much smaller cap? Um, so is, is there a one size fits all for audit quality indicators? Um, I, I could start. I, I think in general, when we look at audit quality indicators and other requirements, you know, including ISQM, for example, um, you know, we are always supportive of, of scalable risk-based approaches, principles-based, I shouldn't say always generally. Um, and, and I would expect that quality indicators could be scalable. And I guess I think to your example there, Coca-Cola, a large multinational company, which presumably has a large multinational audit team, um, there could be slight nuances. Maybe there are more specialists 
likely component auditors, but I, I would think it, the same types of questions that have come up today, workload, uh, phasing. I mean, again, it's perhaps a bigger scale in terms of coordination, but a lot of the discussions I, I think would be still relevant, you know, for a small audit versus a large audit. Perhaps you need more data for a large company. Um, it could be, you know, again, but I, I've worked on global audit teams and, and I think that's par for the course, whether, you know, in, in, in current audit committee communications, you're going to talk about the global issues that face the audit, including, again, component auditor. So I think that's why audit quality and cares do need to, if, if they were to uh, be mandated, which sounds like in other jurisdictions they are, of course, as we've said, they're not in the U.S., but, you know, it is, you do have to be, I think, cautious about allowing them to have some flexibility and be scalable. Majority, and uh, so that that's the company size. Uh, but also, you have the audit, the size of the audit firm. Right? You know, in Portugal, would you expect yes. all audit firms to provide the same audit quality indicators, for example? Uh, no, and <laughs> our our discussion when we develop our model, we were very conscious that the model that we wanted to develop. Uh, will be applicable uh, to uh, PIE auditors with a certain dimension. Uh, obviously, uh, the model that one country uh, likes to develop is to consider uh, their audit market. What are the audit firms? How their dimension, uh, their cap capability to uh, obtain data, because it's uh, very different uh, in the market that, uh, for example, uh, all uh, all of the most audit firms have uh, a bigger dimension, and they uh, use, for example, a lot of technology. So, Therefore, you can uh, uh, address or think on an indicator on uh, technology. But if you have a market with smaller audit firms where technology is uh, less implemented, uh, that indicator does not make sense. So uh, we uh, defend that uh, you uh, need, in order to, to make a model that uh, will give you uh, right conclusions, uh, you need to address uh, and to define indicators that are adapted to our, your audit market. Okay. Sorry, David, can I... Uh, increase one word uh, please, quick on Japan. Sorry, it's true that that we already uh, tell, but of course there are some uh, some indicators can could be scalable for small entities. Okay, so in our model we develop for PIE auditors, but we defend also that could be useful and could and is possible uh, in our understand that some indicators could be applied in small audit firms of course we need to understand and what is the capacity to to audit small audit firms to respond then so is a trade off uh, but it's possible our model is to apply to pie auditors but we defend also that it's possible to develop a specific model for small auditors. OK, sorry. Thank you. Oh, that's good. Uh, thank you, Thiago. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so we'll, we'll, we'll close with one, uh, one uh, question that uh, is, is close to my heart. And I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on this uh, in the time we have, we have left, um, which is a question of whether, um, you know, especially if you, from, a, from an international audit firm's point of view, whether uh, one day achieving um, internationally consistent audit quality indicators is a is a pipe dream. Uh, is it desirable? Is it achievable? Um, you know, if you could, you know, we have less than five minutes left. Uh, so if you could try and keep your answer short, but uh, really keen to go go around the uh, the panel to to conclude on this topic. Who wants to start? Two, two couple of words is very quick. It's possible and is desire, but it's a long, <laughs> a long path to, to, 
to because it's, there are a lot of uh, interests, but it's possible and desire to compare in the play. Of course, there are difficult. The, the same definitions, the same reports will be difficult, but it's desire and it's possible. It's only two words that I <laughs> contribute. Thank you, Sergio. David, if I may, um, please. Of course, there is the desire uh, because it would be beneficial if every Deloitte firm, for example, uh, has to report the same uh, AQIs. But you have to deal with local regulators and their their opinions as well. So uh, yes, there is a desire. Do I see it happening in the near future? I don't think so. And I, possibly there's a role for EVR, for example. Yeah, let's keep going. Vanessa? Um, I, I guess I'd like to be optimistic and say it's possible. I'm not in the weeds. We haven't done a pilot on this on our end in several years. I know it was very challenging in the early stages for the reasons, Tiago, you talked about, which is that definition. So I think it's challenging. I don't want to say it's not possible, but I think if you are going to go down the road of AQIs, I mean, I think with a lot of auditing standards, harmonization, whether it's exactly the same, but some harmonization is definitely desirable. I would agree, but challenging. Good. Let's keep going. Charity. Well, I, I, I think I think at the end of the day, um, we we are um, we are talking here about um, what are audit quality indicators used for. Um, I mean, the the to harmonize or to agree on the same indicators, I think will easily be possible once we agree what the purpose of it is. And I think there there is the difference. Yeah, very good comment. Jorati, do you want to add anything? No, I, I agree with Tiago. I think that it's possible and it's desirable. Uh, and obviously, uh, the, the challenge will be uh, to read their re that results and uh, the complexity, but uh, it's possible, I think. Very good, very good. But on this note, I'd like to thank you all uh, you know, Vanessa, Gioretti, Tiago, Joachim, Ferry, thank you very much for joining this panel. Uh, I hope we've managed uh, to make this topic of audit quality indicators interesting um, uh, because it is a very interesting topic. It enables us to talk about audit quality in a positive and constructive way to have, as Joachim mentioned, and, and, and most of you actually have said, to initiate a, a positive discussion on quality uh, you know, away from, um, you know, starting a discussion on quality only when we see an audit scandal on the front page of a newspaper. I think it's, it enables us to go into more of a, of a virtuous cycle. Uh, and I think it's, it's a really, really important topic. It's not an easy topic. Uh, you know, you've all said it, that it needs uh, judgment and uh, it, it's, it's a start of a discussion. And I think today our panel was also the start of a discussion. We've seen that a lot of projects are at the initial stages and uh, and there will be much further developments, no doubt, in the coming coming months and, and years. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to uh, to to have uh, another such panel to to explore how this topic is uh, is evolving in the future. So thank you very much for your contribution. I'd like to also thank uh, very warmly uh, Amanda and Arun who have put together this uh, this webinar and have organized it. You may also have seen earlier in the um, on the video, uh, a guest appearance from uh, Hilde Blom. Uh, so thank you, Hilde, for, for doing this video. Uh, and uh, on this note, it's exactly um, uh, five o'clock for me, six o'clock for most of you. And Vanessa, I'm not sure what time it is for you. Uh, but uh, good luck for the rest of your day and good luck on all these really exciting uh, audit quality indicators projects. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.